Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, good to see you this morning. Amen. In the house of the Lord on this great Lord's Day. And praise the Lord, the rain held off and not raining over at Magnolia. It came down right as we were starting. So everybody to come in. But hey, God uh, got us through and we're, uh, we're ready to go. Well, I wanted to tell you a story about a man that decided uh, him and his wife were going to go on vacation to sunny Florida. And the way their arrangements was that the husband uh, was going to go up a day early and then his wife was going to fly to Florida uh, a day later and they were up in the north in Chicago. So they worked it all out. Well, the husband gets to Florida and he gets the hotel room and gets booked in and decides to send his wife an email before she comes up the next day. But he typed one letter wrong in the address and instead of going to his wife, it went to a woman who just lost her husband the day before. And so the woman pulls up the email and reads it and falls out cold. Her daughter hears her hit the floor, thump, and runs in to see what happened to mom. Mom's laying there on the floor and the daughter reads what was on the computer. And it said this, my darling wife, I just checked in. I made my destination. Everything is prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> Looking forward to being with you again, your loving husband. P.S. Sure is hot down here. <laughs> so, we find ourselves in many situations and conflicts and struggles in life, amen? Some of them we cause ourselves. Some of them are caused by other people and some of them we need to work out whether they're internally or externally in our life. And so this morning we continue on in our series of Nehemiah part seven and we will be looking at conflict and how Nehemiah handled conflict and how leaders handle conflict. So you can see what was covered, Brother Joe's been covering in the series about how leaders pray and plan and motivate and organize and handle opposition. That's what's been covered so far. And so... As we looked at Nehemiah in chapter 2, there was derision. They, in fact, they made fun of them, of ridiculed them, how they were trying to build this wall and really had no experience in building. Then they, the enemy, outside enemy, came with discouragement. Y'all never going to finish this. And then they came with danger tactic. You know, we're going to kill you. You know, we're going to kill y'all doing this. So they had all those three things to face. And so today we'll be looking at two more Ds, division and discord. Those are other ways that the enemy tries to come against us. If he can't come against us with derision and discouragement and danger, then he, can, he has plenty of tools in his tool pouch to come against us in the Christian life. And these are two of his favorite, division and discord. He gets us separated with her husband, wife, families, churches, pastors, and members, members to members. He, he loves division and discord, disunity. He, he loves that. He keeps doing that today. He did it then with Nehemiah, and don't think he won't do it with us. All these five are his toolboxes of choice and the tools of choice. He'll continue to do it. it it'll never end. He, he loves destroying our lives, or trying to anyway. And so, Brother Joe covered chapter 4 last Sunday, and that was opposition from the outside. Remember, Sanballat and all these other people were always coming in to try to do damage. That was outside opposition. But in chapter 5, it's internal opposition. And that's what we're going to look at today is the internal opposition because that's just as important. Now, if you think about your family or your marriage, how much is internal and how much is external? A lot more is internal, isn't it? You may fuss about what the devil's doing and the world's doing, but a lot of it's having internal. If you look at your family issues, yes, yeah, some are outside influences, but a lot is just internal. If you look at your churches, the devil, he does have a lot of outside influence to try to make us sway the world influence and his own devilish influence. But all he has to do is cause some discord in the church between member to member, and he's accomplished just what he would do from the outside. Matter of fact, I wonder how much harm the kingdom's done when we're so busy dealing with internal discord sometimes, we don't handle what the goal is, which is what? Winning the loss to Christ. Praise the Lord, our church has great unity. 
I've been in a lot of churches that, you know, seem like there's disunity and disunity. And there's hardly ever that here. And I praise the Lord for that. Now, don't, don't not listen. Okay. We don't have it that down pat. <laughs> you know, because that's where the devil wants to come in with disunity in every capacity. He's complaining or rapping or whatever. He likes to just prod and prick so that he can destroy from the outside. And so we'll be looking at how leaders resolve conflict because even Jesus said, if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. What is the house? Well, if it's your family, that house will fall if it's not you if it's not united. Your church, that house will fall if it's not united. Your business, that will fall if it's not united. And on and on and on. Jesus, you could apply that to almost anything. You have to have the home, the church, the family, relatives. It needs to be united front or else there's always destruction laying around the corner. You see that in in sports teams, you know, you'll watch a football game and maybe the people or the couch potatoes or the commentaries will say, that team beat itself. You've heard that. In other words, they just, they had disunity. The quarterback was against the running back and they had internal squabbles in the locker rooms and one wanted to get more praise than the other and they just didn't come out united and that team beat, beat itself. They just didn't come out united. You know that's why they wear the same kind of uniforms and you know that's why they call them uniforms. Did you catch that? Why? Because the owners know that unity is, you know, they're like, you know, I like a brown one. Well, why, get yourself a brown one. Well, I kind of like red. Well, you wear a red uniform. Well, then they wouldn't be uniform. <laughs> We're all the same color jersey. Fighting the same team with the same goal in mind is to win people to Christ and grow people in the unity so they can serve and be the light to the world. So we all have a uniform mission and we need to keep that in mind. We're a team that is united. But don't, don't get it wrong. Satan doesn't like unity. And he doesn't like it in your marriage and he doesn't like it in your home and he hates it in the church. And so he's always going to be prodding for any of those to mess up. We're going to be looking at several verses. One through five is going to give us the cause of this conflict that Nehemiah faced. And six through 13 is going to give us the cure for the conflict. So we'll be hitting the causes fast because we're anxious to find out how do we resolve them, not necessarily uh, what they are. So let's look at some of these causes. First of all, the first problem was the food shortage. There's too many mouths to feed. Uh, we see in verses 1 through 2, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against the Jewish, their Jewish brothers. Some were, saying, uh, some were saying, We and our sons and our daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Famine. They're trying to build a wall, but they've got all these distractions, and one of them is a famine's come, and there's a food shortage, and people don't have enough food to eat. Now, think about it for a while. Nehemiah's left to come to build this wall at great sacrifice. He's got all this. He's taken risk of his own life to get permission for the king, remember, to come and even build this wall. So he's risked his life to come. But God's people were worth it. He comes and there's all kind of trouble worse than what he thought. The walls were worse than he thought. He's having to do all this work for God to make it happen. And lo and behold, what does God allow to happen? A famine. Now, wouldn't you think God would hold off on a famine after Nehemiah did all this? Wouldn't that be the wrong time for God to allow a famine? Wouldn't Nehemiah be saying, God, Lord, this was such a big undertaking with no famine. And now we have to deal with no food and building this? I know you've never done that because you got on fire for the Lord, tithe, gave, got committed, and then something bad happened and you said, praise the Lord. Well, maybe you may have said, Lord, I'm trying to do more. I started tithing and now this financial thing hit me even worse. I got committed to you and then this happened. I did this for you and served in this ministry and this bad happened. Look, mark it down in this illustration. Just because you're serving the Lord doesn't exempt you from bad things happening. You know, don't start tithing and think, well, gosh, my transmission went out. I'm stopping. You don't give a tithe to get. You give a tithe to be obedient to the Lord who saved you and loved you 
and you owe your own life to him. You give him for that, you don't give it to, and I believe the Lord's gonna take care of you again. He's gonna make sure every financial needs met and maybe two more weeks he may bless you double that what that transmission was. I don't know, but we don't live that kind of life by saying we stop when bad things happen because Nehemiah said, I'm heading back home. This is enough of that. If God's gonna add this on top of everything else and he's control of everything, he could have kept the famine from happening, couldn't he? Well, why would he send it now? Well, I don't know. I'm not God, but he did and he'll see us through. And so we see that this bad thing happened right in the midst of trying to do the work of the Lord. A lot of people say, I'm quitting this ministry. Why? Well, it just got too hard. Well, talk to Nehemiah. It just got twice as hard with no food. I must not be doing the right thing. He's doing the right thing. Just because it gets hard and tough don't, doesn't mean to stop. Just keep on. Why? Because it's worth what will end up happening for the walls to be up and God's people to be protected. The second is they were over mortgaged in their homes. We have mortgaged our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. In other words, we are so hungry, we're just mortgaging everything we got to get money so we can eat. That's how bad things got. That's pretty bad, isn't it? You know, everything you own, you mortgage so that you can get the cash out, so that you can eat and have some money for some food somewhere. This is a bad situation. <laughs> this, is, this is not just a little bit of food shortage. This is a major problem. And then the third problem is they have to borrow to pay taxes. The taxes were so high by the king, part of the money they took out in their mortgage was paying for food, Part of it was paying for taxes. Still others were saying, we have to borrow money to pay the king's taxes on our fields and vineyards. Of course, I know you can't relate to this, high mortgages and high taxes. <laughs> Nothing new under the sun, is there? You know, they fought about it. We fought about it. It's there. You got to live with it. And here they had to live with it. But they had to mortgage their home to, to make it, make ends meet and be able to find out what, were, what was happening. Look at what was happening here. Look at these words. We are mortgaging. We had to bar. We have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. You kind of connect these words? Barring, mortgage, and slavery. Don't you feel enslaved when you're all in debt? It kind of feels like slavery, doesn't it? Kind of all these words do seem to go together. What was happening was, the issue was that some of the richer Jews... We're taking advantage of this bad situation and saying, ching, ching, ching. Boy, we got people that'll pay an exorbitant interest rate, which we see in verse 11, probably equated to 12% interest. They'll, they'll pay whatever interest we want because they need money for food and taxes and we'll take advantage of them. Our own people, but boy, it's a chance to rack up. And if they don't pay, we'll use their children as collateral and make them slaves. Well, this thing's working good for them, isn't it? Always take advantage, they would say, of a good situation. Even if it is God's own people doing it to God's own people. And you can see the detriment that that was causing with these high interests. Remember, that was against God's law. To charge his people interest was against it and to put them in slaves if they didn't. So this was everything that was against the law of God. And then the fourth problem is they're complaining about each other. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. See what was happening is that next statement under there, the rich Jews are exploiting the poor Jews in a time of crisis. And they're crying out, this, this is wrong. And nobody's listening to them. What, what does the, the lenders care? Hey, you keep crying out. We still keep going to the bank with your check and we're doing good. Nothing bad's happening to us. And, and the people are just crying out, this ain't right. And they have all these heartaches and headaches to deal with. And really, if you look, the root cause, one leadership law is the root cause of internal conflict and discord is always selfishness. Boil down. Even James put it this way. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. That's where the quarrel comes from. It's always somebody or both bodies or all groups are being selfish. 
We want what we want and that's all that matters. And so there's going to be a conflict until I get what I want. The rich Jews wanted their money. These poor Jews needed a break and nobody was given. And so selfishness ruled. And when you're a leader, you've got to realize that that's where it's coming from and deal with it with that endeavor. You know, somebody once wrote, the most fulfilling part of leadership, the most fulfilling part of leadership is working with people. And the most frustrating part of leadership is working with people. <laughs> so it's the most fulfilling and most frustrating because, you know, there's going to be conflicts and headaches and heartaches, and, but that's what we have to do as leaders, whether it's in our home, our business, or our church. We have to overcome those difficulties and work through them and don't just say, well, you ought to know this yourself. That's why God has leaders. If we all need to know it ourselves, we wouldn't need leaders. We just do it ourselves. But God, in His infinite wisdom, has leaders. Why? Because people need to be led. Otherwise, God wouldn't have leaders. He'd do it directly. He chooses in many situations to use the leaders that He puts in people's lives. So now we need to look at the cure for conflict. What's the cure? Well, we need to be looking at it. What is it that's going to cure this conflict? How does a leader resolve conflict? Now, Nehemiah is looking at a big conflict here. He's got people in a bad situation. They're over mortgaged. They're in debt. They owe high taxes. They're complaining about each other. The rich are exploiting them by giving them high, high interest, probably, again, 12%. They can't pay it. When they can't pay it, the rich people are taking their children as slaves. Oh, man. You think you have some challenges as a leader. He's one man with all this on his plate. Well, what we learn from him, we can learn in all of our situations to use at home, at the office, in our church, and everywhere else. Step number one is he relates. To relate. Why? Because he ends up saying, when I heard their outcry, when he saw what was going on, and these charges, I was very angry. You know, some people have put down Nehemiah said if he'd have been a good leader, he'd have known about this problem ahead of time. Let me defend Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a great job in to build God's wall. Amen. That was the task. Sometimes we get distracted, and I'm not saying this other's not important, but he had a focus. We need to get this wall built. This is what I came here. This is the big goal. And now, yeah, this little thing's been brewing underneath, uh, but to defend him... He had the greater task at hand. And yes, now he's seen the situation. And as soon as he does and made aware of it, he begins to address it as a leader. And he's a little ticked. He is very angry. He said, oh, Brother Tim, let's chase an old uh, Nehemiah. You shouldn't get angry. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. It doesn't say don't be angry. Anger's an emotion. That's like coming up to somebody that just lost a loved one and say, don't be sad. Yeah, I, we've probably all have said that thinking, what did I just say? Don't be sad. I mean, we know what we say. You did it out of love, but you're thinking, don't have that emotion. You know, that's emotion. Now you, can't, you may tell them, okay, I know you're sad, and you may try to encourage them to help lift them up, but you can't tell them, don't be sad. <laughs> just like, don't be angry. Well, anger came up. It was an emotion. I hadn't sinned yet. But now what do I do with my anger? I'm either going to sin or not sin once I get the emotion. And the Bible's saying, look, once you get that emotion, don't sin. Don't go into something, saying something you ought not say or doing something you ought not do and sin because that's what usually anger leads to is some sort of sin. And then you say, well, it was okay, I was angry. No, it wasn't. And so Nehemiah has the passion. Now, why does he have this passion? Because of what they were doing to him. They weren't doing anything to him. That's usually why we get angry. You did this to me. He's angry because you're doing that to them. When was the last time you got angry because what somebody was doing to them? 
Sometimes we get so busy in our life, we got troubles, we got situations, we got a hundred things to do and trouble and grass and yard and this breaks and that breaks and job and done, nah, 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 and you forget about other people. And you're only getting mad about how everything affects me or how it affects you or how it affects your family. What about other people? Yes. Have you got, you know what, that person is in deep trouble and I'm just angry about it and they need help. Bless God, I'm angry. When was the last time you got angry at that? Usually it's, oh, I'm angry because they said something to me and they did something to me and at work they did this to me and that happened to me and that happened to me and that happened to me. That's usually 99% of our anger. But it isn't Nehemiah. He's saying, this is what you're doing to each other and this makes me mad because it's God's kingdom work and you're God's children and this ought not be happening. That's the focus. His, his anger is the passion to say something needs to happen so that God's work's done. And I'm not going to be the one to sit around and just let it go by. I'm going to do something about it. That's how much my passion is going to lead me to action. Has your passion led you to action? When you see the injustice or you see disunity or you see something that needs to happen and you get with it and take care of it, whether it's at home, your business, or at church. I'm not saying go around judging everybody. Oh, I'll look at you. And I'm, he's not talking about judging everybody. He's just seeing a wrong that's happened against God's people and he wants to see this wrong made right. Amen. And we should have that kind of relation. Do you know the people of God well enough to where you can relate to them that they're going through something negative? He's relating. In other words, he's in their shoes. He's feeling what they're feeling. He's saying, I'm sure he's saying, man, if I had this all happen to me, this would really hurt me bad. If I was in that situation, ah, I'm feeling their pain. I'm relating to them. And boy, that causes you to... Take some action because you don't want to feel that bad. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens. Sometimes I'll pray for somebody. I'm so burdened for them. I got to pray to lift the burden off me that I got for them. <laughs> it's kind of a reminder to pray. So I don't want to keep feeling this way about them. I got to pray. Bear ye one another's burdens. Not just your own burden. Bear ye one another's. Because if I'm bearing a little bit of yours and you're bearing a little bit of mine and she's bearing a little bit of hers and you're bearing a little bit of yours, we get it all bared. I know that's not English. Teachers don't get me. Well, educator recognition, they're going to kill me on that. But you know what I'm saying. Share and bear. That sounds better. I'll put that down. Share and bear. Share each other's. See, a lot of people aren't so close to the relationships in a church that people even know about what's going on with you. And you don't even know what's going on with them. How can you share and bear? Oh, but that's what God wants. And then Nehemiah found the situation out because he was part of the group and said, hey, this ain't right. I need to go in here and help somehow. And he does. Step two, don't only relate, but reflect. In other words, think before you speak. Verse seven, he said, I pondered them in my mind. The Living Bible says, so after thinking about it, I spoke out against the rich government officials. What did he do first? He reflected. He was angry. That was the last word. And then after he got angry, what did he do? I need to keep my mouth shut for just a minute and think about it. What I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. Let me just ponder a while. That's not usually what people do. You get mad and boy, you cannot wait to let her rip. You're ready to let that little tongue out of its cage. I heard this week, pastor talking about that cage. You know, it's got two layers. Ching of teeth. And ching of lips. God gave it a two-door protection because that thing is so wicked. One cage is not enough. And so before you let it out to speak, the teeth got to go ching and the lips got to go ching. And boy, here it comes. And it better be good if you open both layers. And Nehemiah says, okay, before we open this cage door, let's make sure this little bad boy is in control. And that I only say what God leads me to say and not what I feel like saying. See, most communication is what I'm doing up here. What's going on right here? Well, my brain, what little there is up there, is thinking of words to say and my lips are speaking. I'm thinking I'm saying, I'm thinking I'm saying, I'm thinking I'm saying. That's what I'm doing up here. 
Think, say, think, say, think, say. But when you get in a conflict situation, a bad situation, a confrontational situation, an anger situation, if you do what I'm just doing, you're headed for trouble big time, buddy. You say, I'm just going to give them a piece of my mind. Well, better watch it because you don't have any to spare. You better watch what you say. You know, what you want to say is, I'm thinking it, and why don't, why, Brother Tim, should I not just say it if I'm thinking it? Well, you shouldn't. Ponder on it. And think about what you're about to say. Is that going to do any good or is that going to make it worse? Well, 98% of the time, if you just think, talk, think, talk, it's going to make it worse. Stop a little bit. Say, okay, I only want to speak through, through being spoken through. So Holy Spirit, if that's what you want me to say, then I'll open both cage doors and that be what we say. But if that's not what you want me to say, I'm not going to say, and I'm going to take a little time to ponder it because I'm angry. And that's the way it should be. We should take that time to, to think it through and to ask God and to, to reflect. You know, isn't, isn't that what James says? Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. But when you're upset, you reverse that. You're slow to listen. You don't want to listen to what they have to say. But you're quick to speak and you're quick to get angry. See, our flesh is just the opposite of that verse. Just calm down. And Nehemiah took a little time to reflect, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to say and do what's right. I've seen so many people have this situation that's gone from here to here, and once they open their mouth and say what they think, it goes from here to here to here to here to here. If you just stopped right here, pondered it, it could have went back up. Leaders do what Nehemiah said. I'm going to think before I speak. That's the only way to handle conflict so that it doesn't get worse than what it is. What was it? San, San Francis of Assisi was trying to teach his disciples a lesson. And he told them, all you take these feathers and put one at every doorstep and throughout the village. And they went and put the feathers throughout the, all the doorsteps in the village. And then the next, that night it was a bad storm and winds and rains and everything. And so he gathered his disciples and said, now go back to the village and pick up all the feathers that you laid down. And the disciples said, we cannot. The wind has taken them and they are gone forever. And he said, those are same of the words you've spoken. Once you speak them, they're forever gone. You cannot get them back. He taught them a valuable lesson. You better watch what you say because you can say you're sorry, but it's better not to even say it because you can never get it back. A lesson all of us would learn, and Nehemiah learned it because he just said, I'm just going to take a chill pill. You know, the person you're talking to, the church member, the person say, what are you doing? I'm pondering. Just tell your spouse, I'm pondering. I'm pondering. Why are you pondering? Because I'm angry and I may say something I regret. Pastor Tim said, verse 7 said, I pondered. So I'm pondering. Just use that deal. Just give me a second, then I'm going to ponder, and then after you ponder, you can say what the Holy Spirit tells you to say and not what you're wanting to. So, he reflected. What else did he do? Well, verse 3 says that he rebuked. Now, he's not rebuking until he reflects because there's a bad way to rebuke too. Who did he deal? He confronted privately the offending parties. He goes directly to the source. I pondered them in my mind and then I accused the nobles and officials. I told them you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. Usury meaning exorbitant interest. 12% is what they were charging. So he went to them. How did he go to them? Privately. Why? Because it was a private issue with just them. So he went to them privately. A lot of people have a private issue and they love to take it public. You got an issue with Sister Sue and you go to four other people saying, we need to pray for Sister Sue. She's, uh, she's really kind of been acting kind of wicked and we need to pray for her. She just needs prayer and I think as Christians we need to pray for her wickedness, you know, so that she doesn't act as wicked as she is. And I'm doing this in love, let us pray. You know, you're doing that out of gossip because you're trying to get even. You're trying to make something public that ought to stay private between you and Sister Sue. 
And that's it. Nobody else needs to know about what you and Sister Sue need to, to handle. That's how leaders handle conflict. Nehemiah said, okay, I'm going privately. What about letting everybody know? No, no. Everybody doesn't need to know this because this is a private matter. And I'll handle it just with the nobles and officials, not everybody. And I'll tell them though, I got to rebuke them. I got to tell them what they're doing is wrong. And you say, Brother Tim, you're, you're, you're a pastor and I know that that's part of what pastors have to do. They have to rebuke sometime, but I really don't like rebuking. Yes, I have to rebuke, but I put rebuking right level with getting a root canal. That's kind of what I do. It's just about equal. Oh, I'm going to go rebuke this person. Ugh. I'm going to go get a root canal. That's, it's right there. I don't know which one is worse, you know, because you don't like to tell anybody. And of course, you go with the deal, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. I mean, you go to them saying, if I had to be rebuked, how would I want somebody to come and tell me that? I mean, what attitude, what words, how would I want them to tell me that what I'm doing is wrong? Then you tell that person that way, the way you'd want to be told. It's amazing Physically, we love, we would get upset with somebody that didn't rebuke us. You know, we have a best friend and we went all day long and said, you know what, I looked in the mirror when I got home and I had a piece of lettuce stuck in my teeth right there and it stuck out about that far. You know, I had a smudge on my face right there all day long and you didn't say nothing. I know I didn't want to rebuke you. I thought you may get upset. You know, when we get upset, no, please rebuke me. I went all day long like that. You know how stupid that looked in the office all day long with that piece of lettuce stuck in my... But we don't, we're not that same way with spiritually when somebody comes to tell us and say, here's something I need to tell you that I, I think you need to hear. Some people don't receive that. But we have to tell them. That doesn't mean be judgmental. We don't go around saying, who can I rebuke? That's not the issue. It's just saying if there's something that's going to hurt somebody, you, you tell them for their own good. I mean, there's parents that say, well, I don't want to discipline my kids. I don't want to rebuke them because they may end up hating me or something. Well, you see how that turns out. You know, you got to go to them and say, this is wrong. I mean, they may keep doing wrong or they may do whatever, but you still have to tell them so that they have the information that that's wrong. And if you do that, that's going to hurt you. At least you've rebuked them, you've told them. And if you see somebody in your home or family or church and you know that that's going to hurt them or hurt two people or being in, you take as a leader the initiative to say, I have to say something. This is God's kingdom work. And I may come out of this worse, but God's kingdom's going to look better. Amen. Have you done that? I've done that before. It's like that rebuke wasn't taken. It was done well and whatever. And then it's against me. But I said, Lord, I'm going for your kingdom work here and not me. And so the, your kingdom work's the issue. You got to go. You got to go in an humble matter. You got to go in an humble way. You got to go, look, I'm not telling you this because maybe I hadn't done it before and I sin in other ways and I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm thinking this will do you because I would want you to tell me if I was in this situation and didn't see something. I told a brother one time who didn't come and I said, I sure wish you'd have come. This was probably 25 years ago. I, I wish you'd have come and told me that. And how many other people would be in that same situation? We go to the offended party and we try to make it right because usually if you don't say a word, what happens? It gets better, Brother Tim, on its own. When has that ever happened with you? Never. You got to go and at least say, look, I've got to bring this up. You know, it's not just going to cure on its own. So we know leaderships, leaders must have the courage to confront. Now don't leave this sermon going, hmm, who can I go to now? Boy, I'm bound to be able to, oh, somebody's not living perfect and you got these eyes and that's not how it works. That's being judgmental. You're looking for something. No, this is the Lord shows you and puts it on your heart and says this is how you can minister to this person. It'll be out of love, not out of judgmental spirit because the judgmental spirit, according to Matthew 7, is bad too. We don't look. God brings it to our heart out of love. And then there's Step four, which is resolution. Publicly deal with public divisions. Oh, he was so smart. He went with private to private. Now he goes to public because he said, so I called together 
a large meeting. Why? Because he's got a public problem too. Handle your public problems publicly, handle your private problems privately, and this is a large meeting to deal with them. And I said, as far back as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. And they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. You know what ended up happening? He told them and they came back immediately and said, we'll do what you say. I like it when rebuking happens like that. That's fun. You know, they came back, you're right. We're going to do that right now. We shouldn't have been selling. We shouldn't have been charging this high interest. It was wrong. And we need to hear that. You know, they, just, they agreed that you're right. We're going to take care of it right now. Why did he go public? Because this was a public issue. Everybody was involved. And so who did he call together? Everybody involved. Why did he do just the nobles? Because they weren't part of that. Pro he said, let's talk to you individually and you will talk to a group. What do leaders do? They know the difference. Maybe in your family, you say you talk to one person in the family. But maybe there's something that involves five or six people. And so what do you do? You say, we need to bring all five or six here. We got to get this thing resolved. It's going nowhere. The leader knows the difference. And God gives that leader the wisdom in the church and outside the church and his home and in his business to know which one do I do. And good leaders can do it. Why is it so important for us to do this? Verse 9. He told them, what you're doing is not right. That's obvious. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? Do you know why we need to do this? You know why we need to take care of this and get this unity back and quit this division and quit this doing bad to each other? Because it doesn't look good out there to those Gentiles when they look in here and see how we're acting. It tears apart the Christian testimony. That's why it's most important we do this because it's our testimony at sake. Why is it important to get the unity in the home right? Testimony. In your marriage right? Testimony. In the church right? Testimony. In your work business? Testimony. To say, I want the cause of Christ not to be harmed. Remember the man after God's own heart, David? David went out and had committed adultery with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, had her husband basically killed by order. She had a baby. And God told David, that child's not going to live. He didn't say because you committed adultery. He didn't say because you committed murder. He said because of what you did caused the enemies of God to blaspheme me. They looked at you, David, and you were supposed to be a man of God, and my enemies looked at you, and by looking at you and saying, that's what a child of God does, then my enemies laughed and blasphemed me. And he said, I'm sorry, but that child, we well, didn't say I'm sorry, but he said, that child's not going to live. And he prayed and prayed and prayed just in case, but it did. Why was the issue? The issue wasn't what he did. The issue was what he did, what it caused to happen. That's what was the main issue and why that was such a severe punishment because God's testimony was at stake. And that's why it's so important here that we, even as leaders, initiate it because we want God's testimony to not be hurt. No, none of us are perfect. None of us. But we still have to say something. You say, Brother Tim, I can't make anybody do anything different. I can't either. I can't cause anybody to repent and do what's right. I can't either. I can't make them change around and do what's right. I can't either. But that doesn't mean that I don't give them that information so that God allows me to tell them. And that's still up to them to do what's right or not. You can't hold you responsible or me responsible, just only responsible for going and saying what needs to be said. And then the last one, step five, reinforcement. We're the example. In all that I just said, you can't leave off being the example as a leader. You have to step out and not this, 
do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> that doesn't work. That won't work with your kids, your church, the people you minister to. You got to say, no, do as I do. Boy, I better not ever see you smoking. Boy, <laughs> you better not smoke it. Better not ever see you drink alcohol, boy. That stuff will ruin your life, ruin your health, ruin your testimony. Better not ever see you drinking that alcohol. You know, nobody's going to hear that. Nobody's going to hear that. Don't cuss, blankety, blankety, blank. I better not ever hear you cuss, blankety, blankety, blank. Well, you better watch it because you can't tell them that. Now, you can't be perfect. And if it slips up, you say, oh, wait, I'm sorry that slipped up. But you can't consistently, you know, numbers are perfect, but you can't consistently say what you're not living up to as a leader. You've got to be able to, hey, you need to get to church, boy, and you're not in church. You know, whatever the case is, we have to do what Nehemiah did as a leader to say none of this other is going to matter if you don't reinforce it with your own personal testimony of what you're asking others to do. We see all these examples. He had a governor's allowance. According to verse 14, 15, he could use it however he wanted to. He could live like a king, ate royally. It was his disposal. That's your money. You're the governor. Use it however you want. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. Why should I live like this when their people are living like that? I'm not going to take part in that governor allowance for my own personal gain. That wouldn't be right to the people. No, I'm not going to take that allowance. He even said, all the governors before me took it. It's my right to take it. The law says I can take it. That's what governors get. That's part of the perk. But he said, I can't during this famine. I just can't do it. He also worked on the wall. Now remember, he's an administrator. He's got to be, okay, you get to that wall and you get over there and let's get more mortar and let's order some of this and bring those bricks over here and let's make sure people are over on that wall. I mean, he's doing a lot of administration. So I'm not saying he was on the wall 100% because he has to, he's the overseer. But there's sometimes you see him slapping on some of that mortar on that brick. He wasn't too good to get his trousers dirty too or loincloth or whatever he was working. He, was, he got out there too. Leaders will step in and do some things that leaders do. Why? Because they want to be the example. And he shared with others. You read verse 17 and 18. He gave, he had people over to his house to eat. He fed people. He ministered to people. He was always looking out to share what he had with other people. Why? Because they needed it and he wanted to be the example too. If I'm asking you to share with people and I don't share with people, then you'd say, well, you're not sharing. But he did. He was an example to other people of what he should do and what he should not do. Wasn't it Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ? He did say that. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He said, that was Paul. That shouldn't be me. No, that should be us. He said, Brother Tim, I can't tell other people, watch, follow my life because I'm following Jesus. You don't even have to look at Jesus. Just look at me because I'm following Jesus. And if you do what I do, you're going to do what Jesus does. I can't tell them that. Well, you can. Because whatever it is, I can't say that. The reason I can't say that, I need to take care of that in my life. Yes. I mean, there may be something in your life that says, wait, right now I can't say that. Well, take care of that. Get it right. Repent. Make it right. And then tell people. <laughs> oh, what a statement. That's what Nehemiah was saying. Do as I do. Follow me as I follow Christ. He made sure nothing was in his life. And once God shows you the situation, which he'll show all of us, <laughs> he'll show me. Sometimes word will come out of my mouth and say, oh. God will say, you're not doing that. Or I'll read something in the world and, he, word, and he'll bring conviction. You're not once he does, confess it and get it right. He, don't, he doesn't bring condemnation to you. Just get it right to him. And then he only looked to the Lord for reward, not others. A lot of times when you do things for the Lord, don't look for people to say thank you and way to go, pat on the back. It's good when they do, and I'm saying they should. But when they don't, you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for the Lord, and I've seen people just stop ministry. Well, it's too hard, or they won't do that, and this people won't do it. You're not doing it for them, you're doing it for God. And Nehemiah said, remember me, O God, for good according to all that I've done for this people. I'm not looking for them to give me money. I'm not looking for praise. I'm not looking for acclamations. I'm not looking for them to do all that I did for them, for them to do back to me. 
but I'm looking to you for my reward. Remember me, Lord, for all that I did. You know, there's another great verse in Hebrews that basically says the same thing. For God is not unjust. Can you say amen to that? He's not an unjust God. He is just. He's going to work everything out. Don't chill out. If you feel like there's some inequity of what he has or hadn't done for you, give it a little time. He's not unjust. So as to forget your work and love which you have shown toward his name, how? In minister, in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. God's not going to forget that. Now some people may say, Lord, remember me and don't forget my works for your saints. And maybe God said, what works that? Specifically, what have you been doing for my saints, the people in the church, my people? What have you been doing? I don't know, but remember my works, O oh Lord. I don't seem to be remembering because I don't know if there's any there. There has to be some works for you to tell the Lord, remember my works. For you to reward him. God's not unjust. He's not going to forget your work for that that you're doing for his saints. He's going to remember that. But you've got to give him something to remember. And we as a church need to be like Nehemiah to say, I'm going to do for God's people what needs to be done because I know God loves his people. And I'm going to minister to his people. To his saints. That's why it's so important for us. Now listen, nothing would make you more upset this morning than for you to hear word that somebody did something bad, ugly, or mean to your children. You can take calm mama bear and find that out and tink, well the claws are going to come out, you know, because she'll take or he'll take, the dad will take whatever you may do to them. That's no big deal. But you do something bad to their children, you know that stirs everybody up. But the opposite's true. You find out what somebody do, did in a big way for one of your kids. They helped them. They encouraged them. They prayed for them. They did something real good. And it just blessed your heart. And you'd be thinking, man, if there's anything I could do to replay that person for doing that for my children, I'd love to do it. God is our Father. These are his children. And God said, I'm not going to forget what you do for my saints. That's my boys and girls. Amen? And what you do negative, like these people were, they're charging them high interest, taking their children as slavery, uh, doing all these bad things. Don't you think God didn't remember that too? <laughs> but they repented and they got it right. And here it says, God, don't forget the works we do for your people. Nehemiah wrapped it up saying, God, whatever I do, I do for you. I don't do for me. I do it for you. You know, you, we close with this illustration. You know, the man did the great violin performance. And he got through and it was a standing ovation. Thousands of people to their feet. Encore, encore, clapping, clapping all over. And he walks back off stage and the stagehand noticed the violinist had his head in his, his, head in his hands just weeping. He said, what's going on, man? Why are you upset? He said, there was one person that didn't stand up. He said, what does that matter? There were two, three, four thousand people up there clapping and applauding. Why would you let that bother you? He said, that person that didn't stand up was my teacher and my dad. And if they don't stand up, it doesn't matter and applaud. It doesn't matter what everybody else does. And if they stand up and applaud and everybody else stayed seated, that would have made me as happy as can be. We serve an audience of one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We please Him. And that's all we have to worry about, is that we're pleased. That's our goal. And if everybody doesn't pat us on the back, that's okay. It should, but it doesn't have to. Because that's why we serve, is because we love. And we make every effort, the Scripture says, to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We all work at keeping unity in our homes. We all work at keeping unity in our businesses. We keep unity in our church. Make every effort. And to make the effort, we've got to know each other. 
love each other. Because Jesus said, what would the world know that we're his disciples? The way we love one another. This world would say, that's it. I know they have a church building. I know they preach. I know they have programs. I know they sing. I know they have an offering. I know they do a lot of stuff. And all that's important. But what the people see is if all that adds up to loving one another, they can't get away from that. They say, that's good stuff. That's what we've been looking for. To be loved unconditionally. That's what we all seek. And that can only happen through unity and through being a leader who knows how to handle conflict so that families, churches, homes, businesses can stay in unity. And that's the kind of leader each of us should be. Let's stand to your feet as our music team comes.